Were those made by a guy who throws himself flat on his stomach to obtain a certain effect or style? Guilty. <laughs> but the only legitimate angles that exist are those of the geometry of the composition. You love that word geometry. <coughs> to take photographs means to recognize simultaneously and within a fraction of a second both the fact itself and the rigorous organization of visually perceived forms that give it meaning. It is putting one's head, one's eye, and one's heart on the same axis. You can see that quote a lot online. People think far too much about techniques and not enough about seeing. In photography, visual organization can stem only from a developed instinct. Okay, so what is this about? Well, it's the composition, stupid. You know, any good photograph has to have you know, a good composition. You know, things like the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, balance, harmony, those sorts of things. In psychology, Gustav psychology, there's a concept called prognons, which is this intrinsic need of the human mind to perceive order. The human mind doesn't like chaos. It wants to perceive order. So any good photograph, any good work of art is going to satisfy that need for prognons. And that's that visual coalescence that Brissot was talking about. It's a sensitivity to the coalescence of lines, forms, and light and dark. It's the geometry of the situation surrounding the subject that gives meaning to the subject. And it's something that you have to recognize and capture on the run, according to Cartier Bresson. You spot it in intuitively. That's not an easy thing to do. That's, that's a very difficult style of doing photography. Um, and it's the kind of skill that results from training, experience, and this magical thing of intuition. Uh, there's a quote by Samuel Johnson that, you know, you know, that quote brings to mind these things about visual coalescence. What we hope ever to do with ease, you, we must first learn to do with diligence. It's like, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You gotta practice. So now, we're not, we're not going to talk a lot about here about composition tonight, but just for the fun of it, let's look at the puddle jumper photo and see how it stands up to some of the standard concepts of composition, like uh, the rule of thirds. Well, here we go. Here's the magic of PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. The rule of thirds grid. Whoa. Um, what's interesting about the puddle jumper photo is it divides up very nicely into thirds, both vertically and horizontally. And most, a lot of photographs don't do that. Most photographs, some, a good photograph might divide up nicely, you know, horizontally into the rule of thirds or vertically into the rule of thirds. It's not too often you see a photograph that does both. Okay, so two points for Cartier or so. Now, what about the, uh, the, the golden spiral? You know, the normal shell shape? Let's see what that does here. What's cool about that for me is it zooms right in on the reflection of the puddle jumper. Um, Sometimes it's easy to forget that this photograph, what's happening here, is all reflected in the puddle. And reflections create an interesting sort of geometry and sort of symmetry in a photograph. Also, psychologically, reflections call forth the idea of self reflection, introspection. On the Rorschach inkblot test, people know what that is. When people comment about the symmetry of the car, if they comment about reflections in the car, how it's symmetrical on both sides, it's usually a sign of them being an introspective person. So this photograph, because a lot of it is all reflected in the puddle, brings forth that idea of self-reflection. And what's interesting, too, about the, uh, the zooming in on the reflection of the puddle jumper is it's only in the reflection that you can really see his whole body. In the actual form of the puddle jumper, the top part of his body is kind of obscured by the background, and it's in the reflection that you can see his whole form. I think that just is interesting in a very symbolic sort of way. Another thing I like to do sometimes with a photograph is to uh, invert the tones, do a tonal inversion of it, where light becomes dark and dark becomes light. And it's another way of just kind of drawing your eye to the different layers and, and shapes and, and the tonality of the photo. Um, Cartier Bresson apparently is one of those people who like to turn a photograph upside down to look at it so that recognizable forms are no longer recognizable. You're just looking at the geometry, the composition. So in this inversion, 
I mean, what it drives home for me is just the beautiful layering in the photograph. At the top, it starts off black, and then it goes to almost all white, and then it goes to combinations of white and black, and then in the bottom, it trails off into gray. I think it's a very kind of beautiful aspect of the composition. Also something that jumps out for me in this inversion that maybe is not as noticeable in the original photograph is that in the background is a poster. And in the poster, it's apparently a poster for a circus that came to town, the Rolowski Circus, and it's a poster of a person jumping through the air, an acrobat or a dancer, um, which is interesting because that person is leaping through the air and so is the puddle jumper. What a coincidence. In fact, Corte was so talked a lot about that. You have to be looking for coincidence, these amazing little gifts that the scene offers you, and then you try to capture it if you can. Here's another one of his photos. Um, let's do the same sort of thing as this. Look at the rule of thirds. OK, it breaks up nicely in a horizontal way in the rule of thirds. Vertically, maybe not as much. But what the, the rule of thirds really draws my eye to is the fact that the girl running up the stairs is dead center in the middle of the photo. Wait a minute, weren't you supposed to, didn't they tell you in photography school, don't do that? Don't center the subject because it's static and boring? Well, this photograph, it's not. It, 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 you know, that's the sign of a really interesting photograph. When you not just break the rule creatively, but you break the rule in a way that like defies the rule because there's all sorts of geometries of shapes dancing around this girl as she runs up these stairs. Okay, the golden spiral. Zoom this in on the door, which is interesting. The door is a real prominent feature of this photograph. Um, and I think for a good reason. Um, if you look at this photo online, some people put this online, they decide to crop out the door. They were probably thinking, gee, that door is too big, it's too obvious, it's drawing your attention away from the girl. Well, you know, don't doubt the master. He put the door in there for a reason. And for me, it speaks to, you know, the door is prominent compared to the little girl who's visually much smaller. But the door for me begs the question, what's behind that door? Is that where the girl came from? Is that her home? What was her home life like? She's running up these stairs, which for me is symbolic of the stairs of development, her running from her childhood into adulthood. We don't know where she's headed, we don't know where she came from, but we know that she's in this process of developing, of, of growing up. And to me, her body language looks kind of you know, a joyful feeling to it. Don't crop out the door. If you do the inversion, the inversion, again, really drives home for me the comparison between the girl and the door. Her head is white. The portal of the door is white. Her dress that she's wearing are shades of gray. The main feature of the door is shades of gray. Her arms are at these interesting angles, and they're white, and the angles of the door are white. Again, it's that comparison, that synergy between the door and the girl, I think, is what the photograph is all about. <laughs> 